and welcome to a roundtable discussion of PCI DSS version 4. My name is Mark Bayerkohler, and I'm a standards trainer here at the PCI Council. Today, I'm chatting with some other members of the Council who have helped develop the standard to shed some light on some of the significant changes to the standard. But first, let's review some background information. What is the PCI DSS? The payment card industry data security standard is a global standard that organizations can use to protect themselves and secure the payment industry. It includes controls and requirements that are designed to protect account card data. So what are the goals for this latest revision of the standards? Well, one of the goals is to make sure that the standard continues to meet the security needs of the payment industry. We've added flexibility and support for additional ways that people can achieve security. We want to promote security as a continuous process and enhance the validation methods and procedures that are used. Now, of course, the big news with version four of the data security standard is that this is a major release and some significant changes have occurred. Now, later, we're going to talk in detail about the transition period to version 4, but I want to point out that the previous version of the standard, version 3.2.1, will remain active for two years. So, as always, after a release, there will be two active versions of PCI DSS for a while. This, this overlap allows a time for organizations to adjust to the new version of the standard. And during that time, there will be some organizations that want to continue using 3.2.1 and others that want to meet version 4. Today, to help us understand all of this are some members of the PCI Council that were directly involved in the development of the new standard. So we have Emma Sutcliffe, Senior Vice President and Standards Officer. Hi, Emma. Hi, Mark. Hello, everybody. We have Lauren Holloway, Director of Data Security Standards. Hey, Lauren. Hello. And we have John Bloomfield, one of our standards managers. Welcome, John. Hi, everyone. So first, why don't we talk a bit about how this version was actually developed? Emma, a, a major revision like this must gather uh, a lot of interest from the, from the community and a lot of people who want to provide feedback. Can you talk a little bit about how this standard was developed? Absolutely, yes. We, we actually started planning for this version of the standard back in 2017 when PCDSS version 3.2 was the current version at that time. And that was when we started putting together those four goals that you just walked through. And those goals have been with us for the entire journey of the standard development. And I'm really pleased to say that these goals have all been incorporated into this release for PCDSS version four. Now, global industry feedback was really fundamental to this evolution of PCI DSS. And for this particular revision cycle, we really offered unprecedented visibility into the working drafts during the development process. There, were, there was input provided from our PCI SSC participating organizations, our assessor community, and also our labs. They all had multiple opportunities to review and provide feedback during a number of different RFC or requests for comment periods. We actually held three separate RFCs while PCI DSS version four was in its development stage. Two of these requests for comment periods were on the draft standard itself, and one was on the validation documents, which included the reporting templates and the attestation documents. And over the course of those RFCs, we received an incredible amount of feedback and input. We had more than 6,000 comments from more than 200 companies uh, over those different feedback periods. Now, in addition to those RFCs, we also did a survey in 2019 specifically focused on getting feedback on those validation documents. And that survey generated another 700 comments, which we took into account as we developed an enha the enhancement and improvement for those documents. So you can really see that this revision is um, really the result of a very collaborative and co cohesive effort with the PCI community as a whole, which you know, we think is just absolutely great. Yeah, that's, that sounds like a lot of input. Well, let's talk some more about the four major goals. 
So we know that the payment card industry is always changing, and so is the security technology and attacks against it. So one of the major goals was to evolve the PCI DSS so it continues to meet the security needs of the industry. Lauren, can you give some examples of this? Sure, Mark, happy to do that. Um, we have some good examples of that with the authentication requirements, specifically looking at multi-factor authentication. Um, I think it's no secret that multi-factor authentication is a critical tool in protecting data. And, and many of us are, are having to use um, dual factor authentication in our everyday use of applications. Studies have found that properly implemented multi-factor authentication could prevent 99.9% .9 of account data attacks. Uh, so we have a new requirement um, for all access into the CDE uh, that access is going to need to have multi-factor authentication. Now this is an addition to an existing multi-factor authentication requirement for remote access from outside the entity's network. Um, this means that there are two occurrences for multi-factor authentication, not just one. Now this was the intention for version 321 as well, so we've clarified that in the guidance. Um, we also have a new requirements for multi-factor authentication systems to make sure they're implemented properly. Um, during this, um, these discussions, we also recognize that some of our stakeholders still rely on passwords. So we made sure we retain the underlying password requirements for those stakeholders. I know passwords are often a hot topic of discussion. And, and many people have been asking if the password rules in the standard are changing. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, we increased the password length from 7 to 12 characters for version 4. And this was due to feedback that 7 characters is no longer sufficient based on current computing power. Uh, we've also retained the requirement to change passwords every 90 days, since for some of our stakeholders, passwords are the only protection that they use, and changing them may prevent formerly breached passwords from being misused. However, this requirement to change passwords will only apply to those systems that don't have multi-factor authentication. For example, systems that are in, um, in scope for the assessment, but they're not in the cardholder data environment. And if multi-factor authentication is implemented, this requirement can be marked as not applicable. Okay. There are so many different ways to implement authentication, with, which leads us to one of the other goals, which is to increase the flexibility that entities have when they're implementing controls. Because the industry is changing rapidly and we want the PCI DSS to support innovation, knowing that not everybody does things the same way. How has that affected the standard? Yeah, an, an example of that still with the authentication topic are updates we made to group shared and generic accounts. Um, this is directly impacting and providing more flexibility uh, because in version 321, use of these accounts was actually prohibited. Now in version four, these accounts can be used as long as the use is managed, meaning there's a limited time frame, approval, um, actions attributable to individuals and other such elements. Another example are the requirements we have for targeted risk analysis. The first kind is for requirements where entities can define how frequently they perform an activity. So the entities have the flexibility to establish the frequencies that work for their business rather than having the standard dictate how frequently to perform the activity. <clears throat> A couple of examples of that are um, targeted risk analysis to determine the frequency for periodic evaluations um, to look at frequencies, uh, to look at systems not known to be affected by malware. And another example is to determine the type and frequency of periodic PY device inspections. <clears throat> the second kind of targeted risk analysis is for any requirement the entity meets with a customized approach. The customized approach is all about providing the flexibility that we're talking about here. So we have two requirements that specify the elements of these two different targeted risk analyses so that people understand what it is they need to do for both kinds. Well, Lauren, I heard you mention the customized approach there. 
which is a brand new method that organizations can use to show how they're meeting the requirement. John, I know you worked on this. Can you explain what this is and how it works? Yeah, well, flexibility uh, is a really big part of PCI DSS version 4. And as Lauren mentioned, this has been incorporated into the frequency of certain requirements through the targeted risk analysis. We've heard from our stakeholders that they would like to meet security objectives of some of the PCI DSS requirements using new and innovative technologies. As a result, we have explored other options that organizations could use to meet PCI DSS requirements. And as a result, we now have two validation methods. The traditional method, which is a defined approach, and a new method, which is the customized approach. Now, the defined approach is the established method of implementing and validating to PCI DSS. And in short, this is what everyone is doing now. This is where an organization implements security controls to meet the requirement as stated, and then the assessor follows the defined testing procedures to verify that the requirements have been met. Now, for those organizations who already have established security controls in place, uh, and also for those who are looking for specific direction on meeting security objectives, the defined approach is still an ideal fit. The new and more flexible validation method in PCI DSS version four is this customized approach. And this focuses on a requirement security objective. In this approach, an organization will determine the controls that are being used to meet a stated objective. In the customized approach, an organization will perform a risk analysis, uh, address any risks, define and document controls, and perform their own testing to verify that that control is working. Importantly, because each customized approach is different, there are no defined testing procedures. Oh, really? So no written testing procedures in the standard? So, so tell me, how will testing be done when using the customized approach? Yeah, so instead, the assessor will be required to evaluate the organization's customized approach documentation and then develop testing procedures that are appropriate to the specific implementation. The assessor will then perform those tests and, and validate that the controls meet the intent of the security objective. This approach provides entities with far greater flexibility to use alternative security controls, for example, where new technologies that are being used can't be assessed through that defined approach. I, I think it's important to mention though that the customized approach does require more effort than the defined approach. And as such, it's gonna be best suited for risk mature entities and those that already have robust security pr uh, processes. Okay, so it sounds like the customized approach isn't for everybody. So then, who can decide if the customized approach is appropriate for an entity or if they're eligible to use it? Well, ultimately, that's a decision for the organization. Uh, and it's going to be based on their choice to implement something other than the defined approach in order to meet the requirement security objective. It's important, however, that organizations work with their QSAs and acquirers to confirm that the customized approaches that they're using are acceptable not only to the acquirer, uh, well, to the acquirer, but crucially, they also meet the criteria that is listed in PCI DSS. So hearing you explain that, the new customized approach does sound a lot like our already existing compensating controls. Can you clarify the differences between compensating controls and the new customized approach? Yes, yeah, so, so many people will already be familiar with compensating controls, and they are still an option for those who are using the defined approach. And just as a quick recap, a compensating control are for entities that cannot meet a requirement due to a business or technical constraint, and where the organization has implemented an alternative control that mitigates the same risk. In contrast, the customized approach is for organizations that have new and uh, novel and innovative approaches to meet an objective of a requirement in a unique way. These organizations choose to implement a different control that meets the stated 
customized approach objective. One point worth mentioning is that we still have appendices for compensating controls in the standard that provide guidance and templates. And we also have new appendices in there uh, that have additional information and details for completing the customized approach. And they've got templates in there for, the, for that as well. So organizations uh, can complete those. And they've got information in there, such as the controls matrix and risk analysis templates. These appendices are certainly worth reviewing to help understand the differences and applicability for both of these approaches. OK, well, thanks for that explanation, John. So staying with the goal of flexibility, we know that another part of being flexible is allowing the standard to address new technologies. Lauren, can you tell us how the requirements have changed for this? Sure, Mark. Um, as for new technologies, um, PCADSS has always tried to be technology neutral, meaning no matter what technology is being used, whether that's cloud or mobile, um, you can still apply the fundamental security requirements that are in PCADSS. These are really general security requirements that apply to all types of environments, even where a technology is not specifically called out. Uh, for version four, we did refocus the requirements and we also added objective statements to support the customized approach, but also to emphasize the broad applicability of the requirements to technologies of all types. Um, and there is the new customized approach for most requirements. And we've been talking about flexibility with the customized approach, which is really the intent of the customized approach is to provide more flexibility for entities who are using different technologies or processes to achieve the requirements defined objective. So one type of new technology that a lot of people are using are, are cloud-based technologies. Does the, new, does the new version of the standard address this? Well, as I just mentioned, the standard is, is technology neutral, but we have added a few things to address how PCHSS applies to cloud environments to address a lot of the questions we've been getting from the industry. Uh, we have added more emphasis on cloud with more cloud examples. Um, and we've also looked at our service provider requirements to make it clear how they apply to cloud providers. Um, for instance, we added a requirement to, for multi-tenant service providers to support or to provide their customers information to support the customer's penetration testing needs. Thanks, Lauren. Well, in addition to new technology, we know that there are also new and evolving threats against the payment industry, that the criminals are also in improving their technology and their methods. Um, I wonder, Lauren, can you tell us about any new requirements that we have that address these new threats to the payment industry? Well, one of the threats that we're hearing a lot about in the news is the prevalence of phishing attacks. Um, so we did use add two new requirements to address um, phishing uh, to help detect and prevent those types of attacks. Um, there's a requirement for processes and automated mechanisms um, to detect and prevent those um, attacks and to protect the personnel. Um, as we all know, phishing, phishing primarily targets people. Um, so there is also a requirement for security awareness training to include phishing and social engineering. Um, it's important to note that we implemented two ways to address um, this risk uh, because we think it's important both to have a technical mechanism to detect and prevent these attacks and also awareness training to address the people side. Implementing only one of these requirements does not meet the other one. You know, just recently in the news, I was reading about another round of attacks on e-commerce systems with criminals installing uh, skimmers directly into the websites. Yeah, and we've added a couple of new requirements to address all these e-commerce skimming attacks that we've heard so many merchants are impacted by. Um, there's a requirement for merchants to manage all payment page scripts that are loaded and executed in the consumer's browser. Um, it's important for merchants to manage these scripts since they are commonly used to upload malicious scripts that read and then take uh, cardholder data from the consumer's browser. 
And we have a new requirement for merchants to deploy a mechanism that detects changes or indicators of malicious activity on payment pages. The only place to do this is in the consumer browser as the page is being constructed and the scripting language is interpreted. Um, however, it's important to note this does not mean that the merchant needs to install software in a consumer system or on their browser. It does mean the merchant detects and prevents unauthorized script activities while the payment page is being constructed. We have included details and examples of how to do this in the guidance column. Great. So moving on to another one of the goals, which was talking about security as a continuous process. Uh, we know that security is something that we all have to do on an ongoing basis every day. But I sometimes feel like some organizations feel like it's, it's a, a point in time sort of activity that they just do once a year. Um, is there a way in the standard that we're promoting people to, to view this as more of a ongoing continuous process? Yeah, I have a few examples of where we've done that. Um, we've added new requirements for roles and responsibilities for each of the major requirements. Um, it seems if, if responsibilities are clearly assigned and people can better understand how security fits into their day-to-day -day roles. Um, these requirements for new roles and responsibilities are effective immediately for all version 4.0 assessments. Um, we also have new and updated guidance throughout the standard to help people better understand how to implement and maintain the requirements. Um, one example of this is there's lots more guidance about relationships between an assessed entity and their third party service providers. We want people to really understand their responsibilities and also that outsourcing doesn't eliminate their responsibilities for security. We also added a new reporting response to the report on compliance and to the self-assessment questionnaires. This re reporting response is in place with remediation, um, and this will provide assessed entities a means to target areas for improvement, and it will also provide transparency to report reviewers about how continuous the security has been during at the entity during the past year. Now, you just, I heard you mention reporting in there and, and reporting or how an organization demonstrates their compliance is important to a lot of organizations, uh, whether they're going to be filling out a report on compliance or maybe a self-assessment questionnaire. Um, John, I, maybe this is a good one for you to uh, talk about. Is this going to be changing or staying the same? Well, on the whole, how organizations validate to PCI DSS is going to remain the same. However, there are now some significant enhancements that provide additional information and granularity in the reports. So to start with, we've updated the report and compliance template, and this now includes less detailed reporting for each requirement, but importantly, more reliance on evidence. We have also added flexibility to the structure of the report and compliance templates that allows assessors some options regarding the structure of the document and so they can customize the final report so that it's better focused for the intended audience. Also, we've added some new information at the start of the report of compliance and the attestation of compliance and crucially aligned this information between these documents. I mentioned at the start about the added granularity, and this has been provided with additional reporting options, and these include full versus partial assessments and in place with remediation options. Taking uh, the partial assessments, for example, this now allows organizations who are assessed to a subset of requirements to achieve compliance report, uh, compliant reports. Now, in short, uh, these options provide, you know, much greater transparency about what was assessed and the specific uh, assessment results for each organization. Finally, there are also some additional elements to the self-assessment questionnaires, including uh, guidance regarding to uh, what in place means for a given requirement. And the self-assessment for questionnaires for a service provider now has more background information on the services that are being provided as well as descriptions uh, of the results of each requirement. Thanks, John. So 
that covers the major goals for the novation of the standard. Uh, but we said earlier we were going to talk more about the transition into version 4. I'm sure by now there are a lot of people who are asking them questions like, when is version 4 going to be effective? When are the documents going to be released? And when version 3.2.1 is going to be retired? Emma, I think you might be the best person to explain this. Yes, absolutely. And I think you actually mentioned this earlier on, Mark, but it does uh, bear worth repeating, which is that the p version 3.2.1 will remain active for two years after version 4 is released. Now, the 31st of March 2024 is going to be the day when version 3.2.1 will be retired. And this transition period provides organizations time to become familiar with the changes in version 4 and to plan for any implementations of new controls or updated processes that they need to make. Now, in addition to that two-year time frame, most of the new requirements, including some of those we've been talking about today, will be initially considered best practices in version 4. And there will be a further period of time after the retirement of version 3.2.1 before those best practices become requirements. So the effective date for those best practices to become requirements is the 31st of March, 2025. Now, whether a new requirement in the standard is effective immediately for version four, or if it's a best practice until the 31st of March, 2025, this is actually identified within the requirement itself. And you can also find a list of all the new requirements in the summary of changes document. This document provides a great source of information for understanding all of the changes in the standard, as well as the effective dates of those new requirements. I think it's also worth noting that there are, there are a lot of new and updated requirements, um, and we strongly encourage organizations to start familiarizing themselves with these changes as early as possible and begin planning for any of those implementation updates that they might need to make, and, and certainly not to wait until the last minute. Um, it's a very thorough update, so we wanna make sure that you know, everyone's aware of the changes. To help organizations plan and navigate through this transition, there are also a lot of supporting documents being released over the March to June timeframe. For example, we are updating a number and planning some new FAQs, our frequently asked questions. The prioritized approach and quick reference guide documents are also all being updated. And we're also pleased to be able to be rolling out several translations of the standard and summary of changes over this release period. This means that the standard will be available in English and seven, langu seven other languages you know, within a number of months after the initial standard release date. And of course, there's training. This is a big part of release of a new standard. And Mark, this is actually your area of expertise, so perhaps you'd like to expand on that one. It is. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, so we're going to have training available for assessors, both QSAs and ISAs. Now, it's, it's worth knowing that an assessor must be trained in version four before they perform an official assessment to the version four standard. So if you're an entity that's considering having a version four assessment done, you might wanna just verify that your assessor has received that training. You can ask them, but another method as well is to check the listings page on our website where you can not only verify assessors, but the, the training that they've received. But it's not just for assessors. In addition to the training that's available for the assessors, the council is gonna have many other resources available for all kinds of people. Um, today's discussion was on a pretty high level, um, but the council is going to have much more detailed coverage of all of these topics in a variety of formats. Uh, one of those is our blog. Uh, the blog is available right off of our website, and I hope a, a lot of you are already familiar with it. Sometimes people ask me, like, how can I keep up with the latest news with PCI and the PCI Council? And I always say the best place is the blog, because this is going to be one of the very first places where we're releasing information about what's new and what's upcoming so people can prepare for that. In addition, it also has all sorts of articles that dive into the technical details that people want to know, including how you can participate as part of the council. So speaking about that, we've mentioned before about how we've received so much feedback that's that's come into uh, making this new version of the standard. And 
that brings us to the fact that the PCI Council, we're an industry body, we're, we're a community, and it's built up of all of us. And it's the participating organizations that play such a key role in this. And if you're not already a participating organization, I encourage you to consider it. There are a number of advantages. For example, your um, additional participation in these RFCs and helping us you know, design the new versions of the standards. Uh, but others as well, whether it's getting a, a, an early look into some of the changes, and, and other things. So I would encourage you to uh, consider becoming a participating organization. And speaking about uh, community, we've also got a number of events that you should be aware of. Of course, traditionally we have our uh, community meetings, both uh, sometimes face-to-face -face and online, but we've got some other events as well. So you should consider uh, penciling these into your calendar, maybe saving the date so that you can participate in them. So for example, we're going to have a global symposium focused just on PCI DSS 4.0. That's in addition to our uh, different community meetings that will occur. And we're also uh, populating our new global content library, which will be another source of, of different information. So I hope you all take advantage of that. I think that winds up everything that, uh, that we wanted to talk about here. First of all, I wanna thank all of the roundtable members here for participating. Emma, Laura, John, thanks so much for your, for your input. And, and I wanna thank all of you, everyone who participated in developing this new version four of the standard. So and in addition, I wanna thank all of you for watching. And I want to encourage you to keep an eye out for all the new material about uh, version four that we've got coming. And I look forward to uh, maybe seeing or interacting with you with one of our upcoming events. Thank you.